welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. To formally introduce myself, my name is Claire Kennedy, uh, she, her, and I'm a Policy and Advocacy Fellow with the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. Today is an extra special occasion because I get to welcome you all to our fourth of five nonprofit candidate forum. In today's forum, we'll have the opportunity to hear from the candidates running for Santa Clara County Sheriff, Kevin Jensen and Bob Johnson. If possible, we encourage all participants to have their cameras on and to please make sure that your microphones remain muted throughout the forum. As an organization, SBCN provides these candidate for to help provide nonprofit leaders with the opportunity to learn more about the ideas, visions, and priorities of candidates for local office. We focus our discussion on issues that impact nonprofits as partners, government contractors, community-based service providers, and advocates. While I go through today's guidelines, we'd love to learn who is in the room with us. So please help us out by introducing yourselves in the chat with your name, pronouns, title, organization, and the native land that you reside on. Now, while folks do that, as a continuing SBCN practice, I want to acknowledge that in San Jose, where I currently reside, or that in San Jose, I currently reside on the unceded lands of the Muecma Ohlone tribe. Together, let us commit to educating ourselves and advocating for indigenous peoples, communities neglected and displaced by the US government and other colonial powers across the world. Since people here are tuning in from different areas, I encourage you to learn about what land you are living on by visiting the colleague, my, by visiting the website my colleague will share in the chat and share that information in your introduction. For accessibility purposes, we do have, we do have the automated closed captioning feature in Zoom activated. Now with this, you do have the ability to move the captions around on your screen to place a more to a place more convenient, or you can disable the closed captioning feature entirely if you prefer not to have it up. To do so, please reference the bar at the bottom of your Zoom as pictured on the slide, click live transcript on the right-hand side, then click hide subtitles. If you're having any tech or other troubles during the session, please private message me or any of my SVCN colleagues directly in the chat. Also related to accessibility, SBCN wants to apologize for the oversight in scheduling this forum on the day of celebration of the Jewish New Year. Now, before we get things started, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this forum, Kira Kazantis, CEO of Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. Welcome, Kira. Thank you so much for being in the space with us. Thanks, Claire. And thanks to the whole SBCN team for all the behind the scenes work that they've been doing to get this um, forum up and running. And so here today with us uh, are the candidates for County of Santa Clara, uh, Santis Clara Sheriff. Hello, Kevin Jensen and Bob Johnson. Welcome candidates. Hello and um, to everyone else who's joining us. And before we begin, I want to explain to the audience and to the candidates the ground rules regarding the timing and the format of today's forum. Audience members, uh, again, we ask that you please remain on mute while the candidates are speaking throughout the forum. Candidates, you will have up to two minutes for opening statements. Afterwards, I'll be asking a series of both SVCNs and audience pre-submitted questions. You'll both have up to one minute and 30 seconds each to answer each question, plus an optional 30 seconds each for rebuttal if you so choose to take it. Candidates, if you'd like to make a rebuttal, please indicate so by rising or raising your virtual hand over Zoom. Please note we'll be pausing for rebuttals upon request only. Otherwise, we'll move right on to the next question if no rebuttals are requested. Um, after I call on you to make a rebuttal, please pause before answering to let our staff have time to change the timer. For the convenience of the candidates and our audience members tuning in, we'll also be dropping the questions in the chat live time as they're asked. During the forum, we'll also be in including a lightning round of questions, which are a series of fun questions to allow us to know to get to know you better. These questions will require a response of only a few words and certainly no more than one sentence. After asking the final set of questions, we'll finish up by having each candidate share your closing statements and you will have up to one minute each to do so. So throughout the forum, candidates will be speaking on a rotating basis. For example, Kevin and then Bob on one question and then Bob and then Kevin on the next question and so forth until the end of the forum. Audience members, you have some options for how to view your screen. If you want to view only the speakers, leave the setting as it is. If the shared screen when we put our timer up looks too big on your screen, you can toggle the middle line over to the left so the speakers are bigger and the timer is smaller and so on. You also can choose the gallery view if you wanna see your fellow audience members. Um, one final note to the candidates, 
please remember to be respectful, not only to each other, which I know you will do, but also to the time limits allotted with each answer. For your convenience, we're going to have, as we alluded to, a timer on the screen so you can see how much time you each have to answer each question. Um, and that, again, with that being said, candidates will have two minutes for opening statements. We'll begin by starting with Kevin. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone's time today, especially when it's a nonprofit board. I uh, counted up the time, the years that it actually spent on nonprofits and uh, on boards and inside them, and it was over 100 years. And you say that that's you look old, but not that old. But that's cumulative. Many times I was on those boards uh, consecutively, state, national, and local, from Kiwanis for 25 years to many others. So, uh, Silicon Valley Turkey Trot, I'm still on the board after 17 years. So, I appreciate the fact that that's our audience today. I've always said that everybody has a story. And for me, that's why I'm here today. I've been with one agency and I've fought for this agency within and without because law enforcement deserves better. Our, um, our clients inside the jails deserve better. I got the start um, when I was 21 years old. I had two children born on Medi-Cal and I thought if somebody would give me a chance, they'll never regret it. My father had been in the worst prison in the United States for armed robbery. I was the trailer outside in Louisiana State Penitentiary. My father, um, the father of my wife had been in San Quentin. We got that opportunity because Santa Clara County gave a chance. And so I never stopped giving back. I was top cop in my academy and went up through the ranks from Sergeant, Lieutenant, Captain, ran the jails as the assistant chief before they unfortunately fell into tragedy after the sheriff got them back in 2010. I'm fighting to give back. I'm fighting because this is something I did in 2014 and I haven't stopped trying to help testifying before the Blue Ribbon Commission and helping uh, correction officers tell the truth about the conditions inside the jails and what was happening. We deserve something better and that's why I'm still here. I trained ethics in the academy of these same people for 15 years and have been teaching management for 15 years and serving on nonprofits and teaching since I've been gone. I appreciate the time here. I have all the capabilities. I've run every major uh, executive management function in there, and I got 97% of the employees that, that endorse me, as well as all law enforcement and bipartisan support from Senator Cortese, Blanca Alvarado, all the way to Don Gage and Mike Wasser. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. You are next. Thank you. Just want to make sure you can hear me okay. Yeah. Awesome. Again, thank you for giving us the opportunity. Nonprofits are a critical component to public safety. And the reality is in a few weeks, voters like you will have the opportunity to make a decision on which direction they want the sheriff's office to go. As this uh, campaign has been moving along, it's definitely starting to be framed the insider versus the outsider, one that's deeply connected with the organization as you just heard and or vote for an outsider who can maybe bring a fresh perspective and a broad paradigm on policing. And what I'm hoping to convince you of today is that I'm the candidate best prepared to address the challenges that the Sheriff's Office is confronting and capable of leading the organization where it needs to be. I've been selected as a chief of police for three different cities throughout California. And I was selected to actually address specific challenges that each of them were facing. And as a chief for the city of Lancaster, I led Lancaster Station through a Department of Justice review, implemented community advisory group, and reduced gang violence and homicides. In Menlo Park, I implemented innovative strategies by partnering with nonprofits as well as the businesses and residents, and leading to national and state and local awards for community policing. We really did a great job enhancing those relationships. And over the past four and a half years, I've navigated Palo Alto Police Department as their chief through a once in a century pandemic, major budget reductions, staffing challenges, and police reform. What I'm most proud about is that I've actually been able to reduce crime and build relationships in each of those cities. And over 100,000 voters uh, propelled me to a primary victory. And I think that sent a message that a fresh perspective is wanted and needed for the Sheriff's Office. I have the experience, I can make our community safe again, and I can effectively address the challenges that the uh, Sheriff's Office is facing. So thank you again for the opportunity. Great, thank you candidates. Um, Bob, I wanna let you know that your video is a little bit choppy. Uh, I can hear you, we can hear you clearly, so you can keep it the way you, you're, you're going right now, but just letting you know that your video is just a little choppy. Okay. Thanks. Um, so now we're going to begin our Q&A by starting with a very meaty three-part question. 
Um, again, a reminder, each candidate has one minute, 30 seconds, and a 30 second completely <coughs> optional rebuttal. Um, don't forget to raise your Zoom ham if you want me to call on you for a rebuttal. All right, questions. This is questions one through three. Over the last year, the county has heard from numerous impacted family members and many people who were previously incarcerated calling for the Board of Supervisors to halt the plan to build a new jail. Community members have also called for improved conditions within the current jail. In support of this movement, 44 nonprofits asked the Board of Supervisors not to build a new jail. One, what is your response to the nonprofit community request to invest in prevention and intervention rather than building a new jail? Uh, Bob, you're first. Yeah, okay, I just adjusted my, I just wanna make sure you can hear me again. We can hear you. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, I think we were all probably part of that uh, meeting a few months ago when they were having that conversation. And I think both Kevin and I kind of aligned with Susan Ellenberg. Uh, I'm Susan Ellenberg, Supervisor Ellenberg, who's supporting my campaign actually because of our positions on really enhancing conditions, both inside the jails and in our communities around mental health. One of the things that I did was wrote a letter in support of Supervisor Ellenberg's uh, concept. I think we really do need to start addressing the mental health the conditions around it and the access to it within our um, uh, correctional facilities. One of the things that I'm proud of is to be the first municipality in Palo Alto to deploy psychiatric emergency response team. And what that is, is a, a police officer in the car with a mental health clinician. And I think that's a program that needs to expand countywide. But I also think we really need to work on the access because it's gonna take years for the conditions, the physical structure to change. So we have to start adapting and putting mechanisms in place that can benefit the people that are housed in those systems today. So one of the things I've been advocating for is an intern program, expanding that to where we partner with our educational institutions to create uh, programs for people studying to be clinicians, psychologists, and psychiatrists. I'd love to get a five to one ratio. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I absolutely will partner with nonprofits like I always have. I, I believe that what you want is a sheriff, though, who's also going to give you the entire truth. And that's why I did not write letters, but I met with Susan Ellenberg. I helped her get educated as to the jails before she ever ran for office. We met three times and I, I have a friendship with her and I fully agree with the front end mental health. I fully agree with all the nonprofits that that's what's needed. But I also know the jails. I was the assistant chief when we ran it as a national model and I called for somebody else not to get them and we saw the tragedy that occurred. So that was not popular, but I did it. So it's also not popular is calling for a new jail. But I would like those nonprofits to meet with me. I would like them to meet with the design staff that included mental health professionals that know the current conditions are horrible. They can't get out of their cells. Even when they do get out, it's not enough. So what we're doing now is mental health clinicians help design this new jail. And now it's $500,000 more costly, and it'll just keep going up. It has to be conducive to treatment. It was designed by professionals to have open day rooms, nature accents, murals. It has uh, wood columns and, and, and things and five times the day room space for people to actually get out and meet with clinicians. I would love for each of those people not just to hear something, but to actually go and see it. Look at the design. Find out if, if you approve of what they're in there now, because I truly believe that it'll get better. They'll have much ch better chance of success if people go and see what we were planning and then not just hear that we're building jails to incarcerate people. We'll never incarcerate away out of a problem. We need population uh, lowering. Okay, thank you. Not seeing any rebuttals. We're moving to question two, which, and both of you touched on this a little bit already, but what are your specific plans to improve the conditions of the current jail? Uh, Kevin, you were first. Thank you. I, I believe that we've got a couple things we've been working on for years and Unfortunately, our sheriff kind of delayed some things. Two times we had contracts that were possibly going for a um, databases like RMS JL, uh, JMS, which is jail management system. Without those capabilities, it's hard to track as we should be tracking each person when they come in. I believe we need to hook them up with services, not when they get out, when they get in. We need to do a audit of people and find out what their needs are and, and save what we can save that's you know HIPAA related, of course, would be protected. But those things in our database, so we can say, let's get them started now. We used to have a couple programs that have now kind of uh, gone by the wayside. And things like um, the regimented program where they learn discipline. We had some 
hard lock programs where people would get life lessons from philosophical works at grade level that was appropriate so people could actually see the consequences of their actions. I'd love to get the, um, the nonprofits involved in coming in and volunteering. We need to hear from the community like restorative justice. How did what you did impact the, the community and how will this help you change? I have job training, I got labor back to me and I've been meeting with HVAC and electrical and all of these to prepare people for sustainable jobs on the outside. I want to hook them up with the, the services, the wraparound services. Right now, I wanna help them continue to get their ID cards, get back on social security. Some of those things she actually was doing well because the people inside the programs unit were actually doing a good job, but we have to make it better for people to be successful. Thank you, Kevin. Um, it looks like we might've lost Bob. So let's see if we can pause for one minute here and see if we can get the other candidate back. Um, I don't know if Alan or Claire, we have Bob Sell. We'll be reaching out. All right. Let's give it a couple minutes and then, and thanks for everyone for being patient. And then we'll, um, if, if we don't see Bob, what we'll probably do is continue on and then we'll catch up with him when he gets back in. All right, I think we'll continue on. And like I said, I think we'll just stick with our timing, but we'll we'll catch up with Bob when he gets back um, since we're not seeing him pop right back in. Um, and let's see. Um, and you um, remind me, folks, if I'm not, if I'm incorrect here, but Kevin, you did finish your one minute and 30 seconds on the conditions of the jail, correct? Yeah, all right. Moving on to question three. Um, what plans uh, do you have to partner with those most impacted by the decisions you would make as sheriff, as well as nonprofits to open lines of communication and seeking feedback? Well, and that's you, Kevin. So Okay, is that Kevin that stopped or me? That was Kevin. Oh, geez, we've lost both candidates. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi. Are we, I don't know what happened. The timer didn't start. Did you guys hear me at all? I think you just cut out for a second. So why don't we just restart and you can go. Okay. Um, okay, so the relationships, um, most of those I've already had um, when I was there as the assistant chief. I've also served in nonprofits all throughout the county. So I'm very grateful. Right now I'm working with Agape and Bob's Bacalo. Um, so uh, Silicon, Agape Silicon Valley has been actually kind of helping the homeless side of it. What I like to do is start getting those wraparound services, the reentry center, CASU, which is um, the, you know, the custody alternative sentencing unit. And I like them to meet with um, actual community groups like we met within our last forum that have some real input in this. And I think that they'd actually like to volunteer. So for me, the ideas of how we're going to get best partner with people is like my streamlining committee that I did in the courts with the presiding judge when I ran the courts in the county. What you do is you bring decision makers at a high enough rank that can come in together and you start talking about the issues that everyone's having. More times than not, we found somebody in the room that could alleviate the pain of some of the problems we were having in one area just by making a call or making a decision that would help everyone else in the room. So to me, I don't think we use enough of the collaboration on the larger scale. I would like to see somebody actually coordinate for um, you know, all of these different units, also uh, homelessness, the mental health unit. I would like to see somebody in the county actually eventually govern some of these things so we're all working on the same uh, path. Um, and, and so when the streamlining committee meeting happened, what happened was we got results and it was amazing how much smoother the courts ran. We can do the same for the jails. 
Great, thank you. Bob, um, we, we started plowing ahead a little bit without you, but we're gonna catch you up here. So I'm gonna have you answer the question I just asked, which is what plans do you have to partner with those most impacted by the decisions you would make as sheriff, as well as with nonprofits to open lines of communication and seek feedback? Yeah, no, great question. And I apologize. I don't feel as bad because it sounds like Kevin uh, got kicked off as well. But apologize for getting kicked off. Glad I'm back. But to answer your question, I think the partnership part and the collaboration part is key. And one of the things I've done in all three of my commands has really built those relationships. And when I was in Menlo Park dealing with the housing issues, uh, especially with homeless in uh, individuals, we partnered with Life Moves to bring services to those that couldn't be um, placed in homes. And some of the times we get them in the homes or temporary housing, but for those that were, we considered chronic homeless, we were able to bring partnerships into the equation, into the community, so they'd have access to those services, whether it was laundry, shower, anything else. And I think even in, as we move forward with the sheriff's office, we have to work better with our community partners. That's one of the criticisms I've heard. When I first got into this, I reached out to several nonprofits, I remember talking to Jen Loving from Destination Homes and her, she said that's her job. She's been doing it for years, is connecting people. And one of the things that uh, she never hears from is the sheriff's office and those partnerships. So I think opening the door is important. One of the things I've done at all of my commands is create advisory groups. It's something I plan to do with the sheriff's office as well. And that brings in our community partners in a residence all together where we meet on a very frequent basis once a month to where we can talk about uh, collaboration and strategies and moving forward. Great. Um, your video froze for a second. Bobby, still with us verbally or audi audibly? audibly. <laughs> can you hear me better when my video is off? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so we, I'm going to catch you up. We, there was one question you missed. Um, it's a sub part of the other question, which is what are your specific plans to improve the conditions of the current jail? Okay, is it okay if I just talk and yeah. uh, I'll come back visually maybe? It's, yeah. uh, so anyway, obviously, no doubt the conditions need to be improved. And not only for those housed in the jail, but for those working in the jail. And one of my uh, things that I'm most proud of is both of my last two commands, Menlo Park and Palo Alto, when I came into the organization, there were deplorable conditions that needed to be addressed. In Menlo Park, it was their substation, which one of my first acts was closing that. It was a substation in the Bellhaven neighborhood. It had been there for decades. There had always been talk about rebuilding it, but it never moved forward. Well, I closed that at a community meeting when I first arrived because I said it wasn't reflective of the community and it wasn't worthy for the men and women to have to work in the conditions were that bad. And we partnered with Facebook and opened a brand new neighborhood service center in 2015. It's an incredible center, it's innovative and it's really engaging. And in Palo Alto, when I arrived as a chief there, they had been talking about a new public safety building for 20 years. And that's something I got approved and the completion of that is uh, next summer but you still have to address the conditions today. So that's where I think it's really important that a leader comes in, identifies some of those core things that need to be addressed, whether it's the living conditions or the operating conditions. And we really have to start using technology to get services into the facility, such as telehealth, visiting, so we can start at least getting access to services because the building of the new jail, if it comes, when it comes, is years away. So minor adjustments can dramatically enhance living conditions. And that's what I plan to do. Okay, thank you. All right, you have successfully navigated the first three part question. Now we move to question four. Uh, this question was submitted by Elisa Koff Ginsburg. She's the executive director of the Behavioral Health Contractors Association. At the beginning of this year, the county declared mental health needs and substance abuse a public health crisis. And an article in The Atlantic reports that more than 70% of people in American jails and prisons have at least one undiagnosed or diagnosed mental illness or substance abuse disorder, or both. There is certainly also widespread agreement that the current jail is not a therapeutic environment, to say the least. What changes do you think need to be made at the jail to better care for those living with mental health and substance abuse disorders? The, uh, Kevin, you're first. Sure. I, I really do believe that for the people there, 
that's why we need a building that's conducive with some of the things that I talked to you about. And I hope everyone gets a chance to look at the design and what it would look like. It doesn't look like uh, our, our old jails. But, but also, I think that we need, especially with mental health, is to, for people to realize that it's not one size fits all. It's everything from mild to acute. There's um, different synergistic effects when you also throw in substance abuse. And from all the people that have endorsed me and care about me and, and worked with me before, they keep telling me the same thing right now. You, it's hard to get the mental health side and our side staffed. We have to have adequate staffing. And right now people are kind of flooding out of the uh, profession, sometimes this particular department to go to others because of the, the problems we've seen in the media with our, our current boss. But I think we have to have a staff that's trained and dedicated, hand chosen mental health. That was a thing for a while where we actually interviewed and got people that were compassionate. And then we gave them extra training. In addition to the training, I believe every corrections deputy and every deputy needs on mental health training. So when you combine those things and you start recognizing that we need mental health staff that are um, seconds away, not minutes away, they, we need to embed them in our system. We need to partner. And what I found and what I've been told is that when you have a, a simple uh, compassionate authority alongside a treatment person and the compassionate authority steps back, allow the treatment person there, but the security's there just in case something doesn't go well, they, they do much better. And if you give them a, a system and a design that's conducive, it's going to be a lot better. Thank you. Bob? Okay, I'm just still testing, making sure you can hear me. can hear you. So I love, I love the compassion piece. Uh, what you may or may not know is I'm actually a trained facilitator, facilitator of compassion cultivation training and mindfulness, and it's something that I've created a program with the Compassion Institute. And I think that's important because it's something I want to bring to law enforcement. We've had it post-certified. I want to bring it into the correctional facilities because I think everybody in a system is experiencing stress on both sides. So I think it's something that can benefit us all. And that's an easy do. My hope is to continue doing what we're doing on the front end, because I do believe it'll contribute to having um, as many individuals living with mental health or substance abuse, it'll start to minimize that. And what I mean by that, as I spoke about earlier, having those PERT teams in the community is a beginning to a multi-layer approach. We're building a network between law enforcement PERT teams, the county's mobile response team, and the trust program, which should have a tremendous impact on addressing both of those issues. You know, in Mon uh, Momentum for Health, the recent annual report, they report 98% of clients who have access to crisis stabiliz stabilization unit avoided hospitalization and remained in the community. So I think those partnerships need to grow. I'm an advocate, I have been, it's part of my platform, but I think we can also do better for those housed in the system. They have to have access to care. As I mentioned, that intern program will dramatically increase their connection with a human. We have to start working with the environmental design so we can move forward. Okay, thank you both. Um, seeing no rebuttal requests, moving to question five. This question was submitted by Liz Milner from the Correctional Institutions Chaplaincy Santa Clara. Currently, there is a dearth of services in both jails, particularly the main jail, and very few of the current services are provided by community-based organizations who can often provide evidence-based, culturally relevant, and competent services and a continuity of care for individuals who are re-entering the community. What is your stance on increasing community-based programs and services to those who are incarcerated? And Bob goes first this time. Yeah, you know, the programming, again, I'm just hoping I'm staying connected. You're good. The, pro, uh, the programming nonprofit partnerships, huge. One of the conversations, well, I've had a few of them now with the Sheriff's Programming Unit. Is there the, Ever since the pandemic began, the access to programs has diminished dramatically. So we really need to make that a priority. And that's what they're saying it's not right now. And I really want that to be a priority to bring more programs in. We have to start reevaluating how correctional facilities are used. I've been advocating to make them more of an educational institution, meaning the programs are available from day one relocating some of the major rehabilitation programs that are at the state level into the local level. That's partnerships, that's programs, it's accessibility. So I really want to get to a point where our correctional facilities are no longer called that. They're called educational institutions because either way, if somebody comes in from a criminal offense and they're being housed there, they should be able to have access to a path out of corrections permanently. 
So I'd love to see them get to a point where we have them graduate out of incarceration rather than just being released from incarceration. Those are programs we can do. It's something we have to do because the system is broken and we need to reimagine it. Thank you. All right, and Kevin. Yeah, this is one that I really enjoy because when I was there, we received the Harvard Award for a couple of our programs and we had things like RCP and Artemis and one of the ones that uh, I particularly worked with Office of Women's Policy and my friends Carla Collins and Esther perales Diekman was on bringing in providers who would give parental training to women who would then be able to be reunited with their children while incarcerated for special times. And that was huge that people don't understand what a burden it is to your mental health when you haven't seen your child in a long time and, and also to the children. Besides that, we had RCP and we had a program where um, we would then also uh, bring in educational pieces to try to help them understand what life skills are. Some people have never actually learned how to um, uh, manage their money, to solve a budget, to give uh, love and discipline together in a way that is legal, in a way that is building. It helps them with substance abuse programming. So I think for me, that's the part that's missing now. And, and we can say some of it's on COVID, and I believe part of that's true. But part of it is that I believe for the last little while, and I've, I've been informed this from the people that are still working there, I think we've got some people that have been in trouble and it's been more about image than substance. We have to have the partnerships that are real. We have to actually look at the data that says, how are we going to help people? And I've got the connections to make that happen right now, like we did before. I want to get back better than we were. All right. All right, this is a time to take a deep breath. Uh, we're at our lightning round questions, a little more casual. Um, Bob, if you wanna try to go back on video, I think the stakes are a little lower here because um, we're going to just ask your very short responses to some more fun questions. Um, the first one is, what was the last book you read? And Kevin goes first. Boy, so the last book I read was actually on management, and I'm trying. I'm having a hard time re remembering the title, but it was a, it was one of the fifth discipline books about how servant leadership and about how actually uh, building your uh, people instead of trying to get power. Got it, Bob. Yeah, the very last book was White, White Fragility. Uh, we went through police reform and actually read quite a few books uh, for awareness. It was great. All right, and Bob, the next one is for you first. And the question is, what is your favorite movie? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, actually one of my favorite, and many of you may not remember is Big Fish. Uh, I just thought it was a very moving uh, movie. All right, Kevin, favorite movie? Well, I've watched uh, a lot of movies with my grandchildren, so I, that, that qualifies it. But um, one of their favorites uh, since we were little is, uh, it was called, uh, uh, Fred McMurray movie. It's very, very old. And it was uh, Follow Me Boys. And um, it talked about someone who had a drunk father and then how he helped, got helped out by some people. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite tradition or holiday, Kevin? I love Thanksgiving. And because um, people gather around and we start thinking about how much we have rather than how much we need. And Bob, your favorite. Yeah, actually, that was the first one that came to my mind as well. So I'm a big fan for trying to bring family together, and especially since it's been more challenging over the years. All right. Speaking of favorites, um, Bob, what is your favorite hobby? Ooh, hobby. It's definitely not golf because my sons keep reminding me of that. Um, <laughs> I would have to say running right now. All right, Kevin, hobby. Well, I think that it's it was running. My knees are getting a little old, but um, all of my kids and grandkids have started uh, trying to do something to be healthy, and, and I love running as well out in nature. All right. And Kevin, back to you. What is one interesting fact about yourself? Boy, uh, I did voices as a youngster. I was in a couple of uh, shows where I was actually the MC, and I could do some voices, and my kids always loved it when I... <laughs> Okay, that has not happened in another one of our four yet. So, all right, no <laughs> shoot it. All right, Bob, can you beat that? What is the one interesting? Uh, I fact think what uh, brings everybody a smile when they hear it is that I was a stormtrooper in Revenge of the Jedi, and it was actually, you know, it ended up coming out as Return of the Jedi, but in pre-production it was Revenge of the Jedi, and I have the uh, original sweatshirt and photo and everything, and a signed autograph from Mark Hamill. So it was a uh, Neat time in my life. 
All right. Um, and then back to you, Bob, what is your one of your favorite musical artists? Well, I have to say my son right now. Uh, you know, it's, it's, if I'm being honest, it was probably growing up uh, heavy metal, but my son followed, uh, he loved music and he's 34 years old and plays his, makes his own music now. So I would say uh, Cody Johnson is my favorite musician. Got it. And Kevin, favorite musical artist? The concert that's been canceled many times to COVID that I've never been able to go to yet is Celine Dion, and I can't wait someday. All right. And back to you, Kevin. What's your favorite meal? Oh, it's tacos. That's, uh, yeah, tacos. All right, Bob. Tacos or something else? No, it's, there, it's not tacos. And my wife's not listening, so I'll say it's pizza. I love pizza. <laughs> I could probably eat it five days out of the week. All right. Bob, who's your hero? Um, I, I think real honestly, and this sounds probably common, but it's my dad, um, just because of all the physical challenges he's had to overcome uh, and he's still with us. And so I'm very proud of him. Kevin, who is your hero? It's my mom. Uh, she was 15 when she got married, 16 when she had me and, uh, I lost her, my dad and my stepdad within two years, about six years ago. So she was incredible. She kept us alive and did a good job. All right, this is the last uh, lightning round question. And Kevin, what is your proudest accomplishment? I think the proudest accomplishment is changing the cycle of uh, violence and addiction and uh, in my family and, and giving my grandchildren something to hope for. Bob, your proudest accomplishment? Yeah, it's definitely parenting. Um, you know, that's a huge commitment. And I, as I mentioned, I have two sons and uh, they're both uh, amazing young men. So I think uh, being able to be a mentor and role model for them uh, is pretty incredible. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for sharing a little bit about yourself, being willing to be open there. Um, we're going to move back to our substantive questions. And um, just a reminder, I think you probably already remember this, that you each have one minute, 30 seconds to answer the question and a 30 second rebuttal if you raise your Zoom hand. Thanks team for putting the timer back up. And we'll move right to question six. Black, Indigenous, and people of color are heavily disproportionately represented in our county's jail population. The local nonprofit community has been deeply engaged in anti-racism work as over 150 nonprofits have signed our racial equity pledge thus far. What specific strategies would you take to dis address this disproportionality in your role in leading a law enforcement program as well as overseeing the jail? Oh, sorry. Kevin is first. I need to Thank tell you. you that. <laughs> no worries. I just, yeah. So, you know, I was on the disproportionate minority confinement committee for, I think it was two years before when I was a lieutenant and captain. And what I have found is that by understanding a multidisciplinary system of all the other components with a public defender, with district attorney, with probation, that helps. But one thing that I'm most proud of is I was a graduate of the FBI National Academy, 10 weeks in Quantico, with 250 students and I have 17,000 contacts that I can pick up a phone at any time and except North Korea and North Korea and China, they, we, they weren't invited, but we had 40 something other countries represented as well. So whenever I'm looking for best practices or whenever somebody's called me for help, just picking up the phone and showing that you're an NA grad, that you've learned uh, emerging issues, best practices, um, concepts of the legal system and the justice system. That's what I would use to find best practices now. I think we lead in some, but I believe that we can, you know, we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. So I'd love to partner not only locally, but get the best practices and what we're doing to solve these issues all across the state and across the nation and across the world. So for me, it's getting those key stakeholders together, like the streamlining committee meeting. And I believe we have to take a hard look at data and don't be scared of it. We have to look at it, own it, because I don't believe our current uh, leader has owned it. And one of the things I've called for is reform, the other is transparency. I don't think you can actually move forward until you sit there and take a look at the truth and say, we have to do better. And that's what I'm hoping to do. All right, thank you, Bob. Yeah, you know, one of the last, uh, well, the last few years, actually, around police reform, when that really uh, became a national topic in June of 2020, you know, I was definitely engaged in those conversations. And some of my colleagues have thought that was a challenging time. I thought it was an amazing time. And it really created an opportunity to hear from the community uh, in all sorts of different components and how they want us to serve. I think we do need to change. 
one of the things that I'm very proud of, like I mentioned, is my work in mindfulness and compassion training and building of that program with the nonprofit Compassion Institute, because that's going to better our profession as a whole, uh, I can assure you, because that program helps us realize us law enforcement, the common humanity piece, which has been missing. And it really has us looking in compassion, not only for ourselves or significant others, but the communities we serve. And the Compassion Institute as that partner helped build that to a model that is sustainable and now can be offered uh, to law enforcement throughout the state. But those kind of partnerships being created, figuring out solutions is really important. The other one that I was always proud of was the work that was done in Los Angeles around juvenile education. Uh, it was a program developed with the Museum of Tolerance, which was really important because we were going to high schools and the program, uh, you may know of it, it was called Sh uh, SHARE, Stop Hate and Respect Everyone. And it was a very good program because law enforcement was engaged in those tough conversations, challenging conversations with young adults and really trying to create a culture of true respect throughout our community. And I think that needs to come back. I think the pandemic started to divide our country. We need to start bringing it back closer together by working with each other. Okay, thank you. Um, Bob, you are cutting in and out in your video. The sound is okay, but we don't wanna lose you again. So if you need to go off, you might wanna do that. All right, moving to question seven. This question was submitted by Chad Bohorquez from Destination Home. When an individual is released into homelessness or with a lack of stable housing, the chances of rearrest are high, whether due to the difficulties of maintaining self-dignity, self-worth, good health, or basic hygiene, employment, or maintaining the requirements of probation and parole. What changes can the sheriff's office make to ensure that nobody is released into homelessness? Bob, you're first. Yeah, I appreciate that, that uh, question. You know, as I mentioned in my opening or one of the very first questions, that call I had with Jen Loving was really eye-opening for me. And again, she's been working in this, this uh, world for a while, right, around with destination homes. But the fact that she said, if she, in her statement to me that really resonated was, if they, the sheriff's office, would just call, we could most likely find housing. And I know it's not just destination home that's willing to do that and be part of that call. It's probably many agencies and organizations. I know that for a fact. So there, the fact that there's no communication going on, that needs to change. And I think the first step is to just make that outreach. Oh, no. Okay. Um, I think we lost Bob again. Kevin, um, I'll, I'm gonna just going to repeat that question for you and then go ahead and let you take your time. And the question was, what changes can the sheriff's office make to ensure that nobody is released into homelessness? We have to enhance the jail's current transitional housing plan. And part of that is um, there are various levels of trust that are being trying to be built. And I'm saying sometimes despite our current sheriff rather than because of our current sheriff. But what we've done now and what I'd like to enhance is to find out what the needs are on entry, not just on exit, because it's hard. When they come in, they're occasionally answering a bunch of questions and they may just well answer what their homeless situation is. Some on the end will get out and they don't want you to know where they're gonna be. Um, but I will tell you right now that through CASU and through some of the service providers, if we build the trust, we've, we've started inmate groups, um, uh, client groups inside that actually now can give feedback because there are some abuses that happened after I left in the jails. And so now I think there's a better at least opportunity to utilize the structure and change it a little bit to get the trust that we're actually there to have a continuum of care, not to custody, custodize you for life, but to actually care for you. My father's rehabilitated. My wife's father's rehabilitated. I am a big proponent of it. I also know we need consequences and, and, and we have to have that side of it because there are people that I've seen that uh, like Richard Allen Davis and those that, that were um, didn't want to take any part of, of ownership of what they did. But, but if we have those trust levels built early on, I think that we're gonna have a lot better chance of success that they will tell us. And then we make those calls. We have those service providers ready uh, to have those partnerships before they get out. And that's, that's obviously what we need to do. All right, welcome back, Bob. Thanks, Kevin. Um, you had about 40 seconds left on the question about ensuring that nobody is released into homelessness, Bob. 
Yeah, can you tell me where you lost me? <laughs> so uh, you know, I don't, how about let's uh, let's just reset it's okay. it. We'll, it's okay. We'll re we have time. We we can set it to <laughs> one thirty and and just if you can be short, that would be great. No, I I will. I think I I at least got through the fact that there's currently no no communication between the sheriff's office and nonprofits on the outside upon release. And I think the first step is to change the operational protocol to make that part of the outtake procedure well before somebody's about to be released. You know, far too often, just as how individuals are released, they're out and they're forced to find their own way. And we spend a tremendous amount of time processing and screening individuals into the system, and we need to do the same before they leave. We need to connect them with the services and the resources they need when they need it. And I think that's going to be the biggest advantage we have is opening the lines of communication. There's technology that can help us do a lot of these things. And that's one of my biggest asks uh, this first year will be enhancing our technology so we can be more efficient in providing services. So again, I apologize for the disconnect. Uh, hopefully we can make it through. All right, thanks. Um, this is, should be our last question, unless we make up a ton of time. Um, this is uh, question eight. Uh, last week, the county's alternatives to incarceration community process began. You've touched on some of these issues before, but uh, let's ask more, most specifically, what would you like to see coming out of this ATI process? And what is the sheriff's role in encouraging or even funding alternatives to law enforcement and incarceration? Kevin, you're first. Thanks. Yeah. And we did touch on it, but I think it it needs to be said that this is probably one of our biggest issues. And a friend of mine, Reverend Jethro Moore from the NAACP, who was the former president, is working on this very program in Vallejo. He was just hired. So I, they stole him away before I could. But I would love to get somebody here to actually help me with this. We have CASU. So that's alternative sentencing. And we have a unit that wants to do well, but we need to staff it. I know that money is tight. But if we don't staff the programs that actually help people succeed, then we're going to be staffing more jails. I don't want to build more jails to incarcerate more people. I just want to build the ones that we have to make them humane, to make them treatment oriented and, and recovery oriented. But in that very same thing, helping them get their social securities numbers, helping them get their, their cards, their ID cards, helping them get educated as to um, a trade. And, and that's why the, the discussions I've had with the labor groups right now have been so promising. And we've even talked, and Bob also has talked about um, the solar and the regenerative and green sources. We have a lot to do and we have so many contacts willing to help, but it just seemed like this administration wasn't using uh, their all their resources wisely. And yet the people in the job, inside the jails, the men and women actually want that more than anything else. So we have to have a long talk with the county. They're not made of money, but I believe their heart's in the right place too. And together we can come up with solutions that fund these types of units and these types of programs. So we should have nobody going out where they're going to be uh, sentenced solely to jail, but also on ankle monitoring and CASU. All right, thank you, Bob. Yeah, I listened in on that meeting and it, it was interesting because I think it seemed clear to the group, they wanna find viable solutions that are sustainable and not just create a list of suggestions that end up on a shelf. And it's gonna require tremendous collaboration, thoughtful collaboration, but alternatives can be found. In the late 90s, I worked with the LA County Office of Education Safe School Center to roll out a weekend intervention program for juvenile first offenders. And I think that was really valuable to have that collaboration. In 2009, when I was the coordinator of the Antelope Valley Crime Fighting Initiative, we purposely developed strategies containing intervention alternative programs in our gang violence reduction objectives. And that one program led to not only alternative direction, meaning keeping people out of jail, but it connected with a local university that offered a scholarship program, the Antelope Valley University, and that program is still in place. So I think as a sheriff, restoring the programs is key, uh, but I also think with the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, that is now law, there's gonna be a lot of money out there for certification programs. And I think we need to really be aggressive and pro proactive in going after some of that. The certification programs tied to alternative solutions and in alternative incarceration. If somebody's qualified and they get uh, they're capable of getting into a certification program, maybe that's where they go rather than going to jail. Looking forward to the opportunity. Got it. 
Thank you. Um, looks like we have time for one more question. This is a very specific question. Um, if we will give you one minute 30, but if you want to do it quickly, that might not be a bad idea. Um, the nonprofit community advocated for the creation of community based mobile crisis response. And the county has responded by approving a pilot program as well as bolstering its own mobile crisis staffing. Currently, when someone calls a mobile crisis for help for themselves, the responding team includes a counselor and a member of law enforcement. We've heard some reports of law enforcement officers running warrants and arresting the person who is actually calling for help. Do you agree that this is a counterproductive response and what can you do about this? Bob, you're first. Yeah, no, I, I would agree that it's counterproductive. I understand why they may be running people when a call comes in just to make sure everybody that's responding is safe. Now, if the, the, uh, re the warrant return comes back as something that the person's wanted for a violent felony, something like that, well, that's important for everybody to know. So I could understand that being uh, a protocol. But again, if it's a low level type of warrant, yes, that sh should not be used as a substitute to providing the services the individual needs. Again, I'm really excited about how the psychiatric emergency response team. It took a long time in creation, four years in fact, to actually partner that clinician with the uh, officer and the building, the layers that I spoke about with the mobile response team and the trust program. We're, we're potentially gonna be, and I believe the model for the country in mental health response. So we don't wanna screw it up. So I apologize for my language, but screw it up by, you know, not using it the way it's designed and getting people the services they need it. Transferring a jail is just going to cause additional issues. So my hope is stay committed with the direction we're going, advocate for more teams, because I think those teams will help lead to um, greater success down the road. Thank you. Uh, and Kevin. Thank you. Uh a very good friend of mine who, whose uh, mother I know very well also started the uh, CAHOOTS program, a version of it, and that was the form that uh, Bob inherited at Palo Alto and did a good job with. Um, I think that what we need to realize is it absolutely can be um, an issue. It can be something that all of a sudden uh, turns people off. It's counterproductive. I do agree that when we know what we're facing, if it was something, uh, especially in, in today's world, where the, the service providers were in jeopardy, that that would be a problem. So I agree that there should be some kind of a, a policy in place that says, if it is a low lying, low level offense, not a serious violent felony or something that will get somebody hurt, then I believe that we should focus on mental health first. We should not be focusing on, on minor criminal activity. We have to get people to the place where they wanna use the system so they can trust us. Again, trust is what's been lacking. Trust is what I'm known for. And that's why I taught ethics for 15 years. And that's why now now I've had the opportunity to finally get to the place where we're going to make those substantive changes. So uh, it can be counterproductive. It should be used in a, in a system where people are understanding that it is a, a policy decision that we're not going to go after low lying uh, fruit. We're going to go after people that really need help and give them the help they need. All right. Thank you both. Thank you both for your answers. Um, and now we're at the time where each candidate will have a one minute uh, period, time period for closing statements. Since Kevin started with his opening statement, Bob, you'll be the first to make a closing statement. Oh, thank you. So as we mentioned, we, we're at whatever, 45, 44 days before the ballots come. They're actually going to get there sooner than that, but that's before the election. And what I would implore you to do is scroll down the sheriff. Don't worry about the name confusion, just for chief of police because the Santa Clara Sheriff's Office needs a leader who's prepared to face the challenges this organization is confronting. And I mentioned, I've led two very engaged barrier resident uh, police departments over the past 10 years as their chief of police. And I want you to know what I can accomplish in four years can be impressive. We accomplished a tremendous amount in four years in Menlo Park leading to the national awards I mentioned. We also worked through and navigated some of the most challenging times in Palo Alto. So it doesn't take long for drastic change to occur. Uh, the Mercury News summed it up with their recommendation that I'm the best candidate to bring the new ideas and implement reform. So I'm hoping I can have your vote in November. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, your closing statement. 
Thank you. Um, I've been in one agency and in one agency, I did it well. And for 12 years, I went against the corruption at personal loss and the loss of some friends of mine, but I didn't stop. And I think that sometimes people look at an insider and they say, oh, we need something fresh. What we really need is not someone who's been to a few departments, someone who stayed here because they were given a chance and they care. I want you to check out the motivation of why I would put myself at risk and fight this long and this hard because law enforcement can be better. And when I found out what my boss was doing, I didn't sit down for it. And that's why 97% of the staffing endorsed me and all law enforcement and bipartisan support left and right. So I hope I get your vote because I've had bigger staffing, bigger budgets as assistant chief and captains than, than some police chiefs here today. So I want you to know that my motivation is to give back. My motivation is to make it better. And my heart has been burning to make this change for a long time because my family has gone through it, prison, my wife's family. My wife's family is Puerto Rican and Mexican. And I want the opportunity to change things, not just for them, for all of us, but they, they touch my heart and I want it better for all of us. Thank you for your vote if you give it to me. All right, thank you candidates for your willingness to share your thoughts with the nonprofit audience. And thanks to our audience for submitting questions and for your engagement. Uh, back to you, Claire. Thank you to our candidates for being here today and sharing your goals for the Santa Clara County Sheriff's seat. Please show your appreciation with Zoom reactions and messages in the chat. And lastly, as a nonprofit association, we want to be accessible to you all as best as possible. Please reference the information listed on this slide to best inform you all on how to contact our team. Your feedback and suggestions really help us improve the ways we serve this sector. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you at future events.